and welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to disasters, business continuity, crises, resiliency, uh, and anything that can be remotely associated with those topics. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, as always, if there is a specific topic you'd like us to talk about or you'd like to be a guest on the show, or if you want to talk about a specific product or service that you offer, please feel free. Go to the Voice America webpage for our show, and there is a button underneath, and you can send me an email. And I do respond to everything, and we'll see about getting on the show. Long-time listeners, or even if you're a new listener, um, you'll learn really quick that I like to read. I like uh, a lot of books. I have overflowing bookshelves piled on the floor. You know, um, looks like an old Englishman's library. Uh, you know, just books everywhere. A little while ago, I was going through um, some uh, new sections of books, and I came across one whose title just jumped out at me, and I knew I had to try and get um, one of the two authors here on the show. The book is titled Meltdown, Why Our Systems Fail and What We Can Do About It. Now, just from his title, you knew that had to be a topic we talked about on this show. So I'm lucky to uh, have today, I know he's very tired. He's been talking about all, with a lot of media today. I'd like to welcome one of the authors uh, to the show, Mr. Chris Clearfield. Chris, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Alex. I'm excited to be here. Um, and I, I did mention that you co-wrote this book with um, another gentleman. I want to say the name right. Uh, Andras Tilchik? Yeah, that's very close. Yeah, so Andras, um, Andras and I have been friends for a long time, and um, we sort of had very different paths. Um, he, he is a sociologist by training. He has his PhD in sociology from from Harvard, and I'm sort of an engineering systems guy. Um, but we, we kind of came together to, to collaborate um, on some consulting stuff and ended up writing this book together, which has been really, really fulfilling. Oh, so that's how the book came about? Yeah, I know exactly. Yep, that's how the book came about. We were sort of thinking about these issues. Um, we sort of observed that, that these kind of big failures that stemmed from, you know, a series of small issues that kind of snowballed into these big events there seemed to be more and more of that happening in the world. And we were interested in understanding both sort of why that happened from the kind of systems perspective, but also, you know, what organizations and teams and individuals were able to do to um, prevent that and why some teams perform better, better than others uh, in, in those kind of contexts. Well, like I said, just by its title, I had to get my hands on this and, and reach out to you, to both of you and try and get one of you here. So I'm glad I, I got you. Uh, before we jump into uh, you know the topic of the book any further, can you give our listeners a little bit of a, a bio on yourself? You know what you do, you know, and how you got to, to where you are today. Sure, totally. Um, so you know, I was I was always a science kid um, growing up, and then I um, I went to uh, Harvard for my undergraduate degree. I studied physics and biology, and I sort of always assumed I would go and do a PhD in in something sciencey, but. Um, really through a bunch of coincidences, I ended up working on Wall Street. And I, I started out doing kind of trading and, you know, using computers to, to figure out how to make money. Um, and then that my, my role kind of morphed over time to thinking more on the systems level, thinking more about, you know, how these, how these systems work together and, and kind of what the risks were that, that arose from that. Um, so interestingly, I, you know, I had this, I had this front row seat during the financial crisis and, uh, noted that that some organizations really did a much better job of managing that crisis than others. And I thought that was interesting, you know, without being, without working at all these places, I had a guess of who was going to do better at managing the crisis than, than, you know, their, than their peers in the industry. And that was kind of an interesting observation because it's interesting mm. to just to, to suppose that from the outside, we'd be able to say anything tangible about, you know, how, how, how a big company manages, manages these kind of big risks. Um, and then I'm also a pilot. So I, I have this kind of very, you know, visceral interest in understanding, um, understanding why failure happens and, and, and how we can think about it. Uh, and, and really all of this stuff came to a head in 2010 when the BP Deepwater Horizon, uh, accident mm -hmm. happened when that oil rig exploded yeah. in the Gulf. Um, and, you know, it just, it struck me that, that, um, two things really struck me. One, that, 
wow, this is really the same kind of accident as we see in, you know, airplane crashes and, and really even the financial crisis where it was this sort of series of small failures that, that led to this really, really big, devastating failure. Um, and the other thing I thought was that, um, you know, it, it, it really could have been a, a petroleum engineer who, who worked on that rig or who was part of that project team and said, you know, no, we need to do this a different way. I mean, they, they could have been the, the greatest environmentalist of the, of the 21st century. And we, we never would have mm-hmm. heard their name, of course, but, um, but it's, it's just, it was an interesting kind of counterfactual to consider. And so uh, I teamed up with Andras, and, and he and I really started to, to sort of dig into these issues and, and try to understand them more systematically. And I guess being a pilot, you really have to be fully aware and well-versed on systems, right? Like that's got to be a skill that, you know, you can't uh, half, half, you know, can't use the word, but half fake that. Right, right. If you know what I mean. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. I, and it's interesting, you know, now, now I'm actually an instructor and so I, I teach people and, um, you know, even in small airplanes, there's a real emphasis on understanding the systems, because if you understand the systems, that's what helps you troubleshoot things. That's what helps you understand things. Um, mm-hmm. And that can sort of be, um, you know, that, that's, that's what helps you kind of anticipate the sort of things that, that might go wrong uh, before, they, before they kind of chain together and, and, you know, go really wrong. Well, you've said the word a couple of times, and I know the word is in your uh, book title, Why Our Systems Fail, here, um, from Meltdown. So how do you define systems? Is it just IT? Is it procedures? Because um, in my view, it can cover a lot. But what what do you mean by systems? I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I think we use the term pretty expansively. Um, I, you know, I think of a system as really anything where the connections between the parts matter matter as much or more than the parts themselves. So um, that's a pretty kind of broad definition, but, but let's break that down a little bit. You know, um, a car is a system, right? It's where you have all of these interacting components that are all sort of moving together in the same direction to kind of accomplish this goal. Um, within that, you can have smaller systems. You can have subsystems around, you know, the engine and the brakes and, and the steering and all these different these, these different sort of pieces. But um, I think the key thing is where um, it's really the, it's the interaction between these things that makes stuff happen. Um, and also you can really, I mean, you can think of organizations as a system too, right? Organizations mm-hmm. are, you know, groups of people that come together and interact. And one of the things that we focus on is this idea of complexity within systems. So, you know, it's, it's where the system is put together in a way that looks more like an elaborate web than an assembly line. So it's not a linear connection. It's a bunch of different connections. And sometimes connections you don't even know that can be made. Um, and it's in those complex systems that we see these kind of unanticipated consequences, these sort of unexpected things that can turn into a failure. Just sort of a small thing can kind of propagate through the system and, and kind of blow up into a big failure. That, you just got me thinking. I'm going to jump off the what our little outline is here today. Um, you said it's not linear, that it's quite uh, complex, and you mentioned organizations. Does that mean that a system can be um, between two organizations or more you know, organizations, it, it was like a supplier to a manufacturer and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 in fact, when we do consulting work, you know, that's actually one of the big places where we. Um, we help people understand kind of how these, um, you know, how these failure stories emerge. And, and one of the places that they emerge is uh, through organizational boundaries, right? When, when some person is passing off a project or a piece of data or even an expectation to another team or another group, that's where you can have these miscommunications arise. And it can happen between, you know, between vendors, between different groups. Um, it can happen between governments at different levels or, or, you know, between the fire service and the police or between fire service from different jurisdictions, things like that. Well, I, I also work in program and project management. And what you just said, you know, I, I wish I could take that sign and put it up on every wall because it happens every time, miscommunication but with vendors or between departments, you know, or even just single stakeholders in the same room. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, a lot of our, I think one of the big challenges and one of the things that we kind of advocate for over and over is that um, the companies that are going to be successful, the projects are going to be successful, um, are, are the teams that are able to, 
kind of acknowledge and, and thrive in this complexity head on. And I think one of the challenges is that even though our world is much more interconnected than it used to be, even, you know, even a decade ago, let alone going back, you know, 30, 40 years, um, a lot of our techniques for managing products and, and, and programs and processes really have remained the same. And so we're sort of, we're kind of bringing the wrong tools to the, to the, the, the project in some sense. Well, that, that leads us into the, the very next question that I had. So what causes our systems to be so complex then? You know, by bringing things in, what, what, what causes it? Well, you know, I mean, there's actually great reasons for complexity, right? I mean, we, we sort of, we talk about in the book, we talk about this paradox of progress where, um, you know, the way that our systems are built these days really give us these great capabilities. Um, they give us this ability to, um, you know, I mean, deliver products, you know, at, at, at scale in efficient ways. If you think about like a shipping network, for example, or, you know, how a company might do something like just-in-time supply chain um, logistics. Like, that's an incredible mm-hmm. capability. Um, but what it requires is it requires things, you know, it requires a sort of different type of connections and, and a, different, a different kind of comfort with being just-in-time than I think we were we were years ago. So a lot of this complexity comes from increased capabilities. And, you know, there's, there's another bit I'd like to mention, which is um, this idea we have in the book called tight coupling, which, you know, we, we've, um, it ha- has these kind of deep roots in um, how engineers think about systems. And, and tight coupling is really just this idea that, that there's not a lot of um, slack in a system. So when something starts to go wrong, it, it, it tends to keep going wrong. It's hard to um, it's hard to be able to respond in time or with enough capacity to kind of prevent the problems as they as they as they happen to fix the problems before they they become these big errors. And you know we're we're not the we're not the first people to talk about this in these terms. We we um, drew on the framework of a guy called Charles Perot, who was a a sociologist that that studied the Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown um, in, in 1979 and looked at why that accident happened. And, and, you know, the official conclusion was that it was operator error, that the operators didn't respond in the right way. And what Perot argued was that, you know, actually this was the system's failure. This whole system sat in this kind of danger zone where it was very complex. So there were these interactions that were hard to understand and it was tightly coupled. So when things started to go wrong, they were likely to continue going wrong. And that, in fact, the causes of the accident, you know, weren't known until, the, the, the investigatory commission spent, you know, nine months digging into things. So you can't possibly blame the operators for not making the, you know, the quote unquote right decision in real time when, when the logic of the accident wasn't even understood until years later. Is, is that because we rely too much on the IT component to do that for us? Um, that's a good question. Can you, can you kind of, can you sing more about that? Well, if, if it's, you know, it's, with Three Mile Island, they were saying that uh, you mentioned that you know they're saying it was operator error. Could it be? And, and I'm not pointing a finger at all. I'm, I'm just uh, saying here that um, because we have so many different systems in place uh, that are IT focused, and you know we have our uh, cell phones and all this and that, that we've become too comfortable to. We have a false sense of security that the IT will take care of us. <clears throat> Sorry, losing my voice here. That IT will take care of it for us. Right. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, you know, I think that, that Three Mile Island was complex because, um, because nuclear power is this inherently complex technology, right? And it, and it was tightly coupled because, um, you know, the physics of nuclear reactions means that you, you can't sort of, you can't put the, there's no pause button on the reactor, right? You can't, you yeah. know, the, the, the reaction continues even, even as you, you know, start to, to, kind of cool the reactor down that, but that takes days. Mm-hmm. So you need to kind of keep removing that heat. But I think your, I think your, your bigger point is one that um, we do see reflected all the time, right? So from everything from the way that our, I mean, I, I bet a lot of listeners will have the experience um, of being in a modern car and having it do something that they find unexpected, right? Um, you know, my car has a, a front facing camera that has an automatic braking system. And, um, Often it's quite good, but sometimes, you know, if I'm going around a, a curve or something, it will misinterpret um, that as a, an object stopped in front of me and, and mm-hmm. will, you know, sometimes tap on the brakes. And 
that is definitely an aspect of the kind of the technology and the capability introducing these unintended consequences. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, we're going to end our first segment on that note. We are talking with author Chris Clearfield and his, uh, well, co-author, I should say, uh, with Andres Tilchik and their book, Meltdown, Why Our Systems Fail and What We Can Do About It. We'll be right back. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody. <laughs> 